Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this, uh, what I've been working on for a number of years is this. How do you sell shaped embryo? This is a Xenopus embryo, and it's gastrulating. It's going to take about five hours to get through gastrulation, and another five to regulation, and there's 15,000 cells there. Uh, there's 530 some members of Congress, and they can't get along and cooperate on anything. How do 15,000 cells cooperate to make that happen? That's a, a question I've been interested in for some years. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's interesting that, uh, that I think the best things that have happened in the work of Genesis in my life has been one of the modern imaging techniques microscopy and the use of progressive markers and molecules and cells. The second thing is getting uh, physical physical type people, mathematicians, engineers into this field. Uh, and the time times have changed. This resulted from an argument that we had many years ago at a meeting with Angela Jacobson who was pioneers in the field mechanics and early development. I ended up a big fight, and I joined him from my, as you know, my predilections about things. And this is what uh, the then prominent developmental geneticist told me. Ray, physics has absolutely nothing to do with the world. Name names. His what? Name names. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Actually, it was Pat O'Farrell. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, I, don't, I think it's... Sometimes I'm. Uh, I don't want to criticize him too much because I've been known. To, I've been known to enlarge on the facts. My dad used to have. He was quite a rack on tour, and he always said, "Never let a story suffer for facts." <laughs> so if you don't have enough, make it, make some up. But, <laughs> but that's not like your science. This is the problem. Um, so we've been working on this for a number number of years, and from our perspective. Uh, more of a genetic specificity. How do you specify pattern in that mechanical pattern? <coughs> well, it involves a region specific, uh, a bunch of region specific cell behaviors. And we, we define those, let's see, where's the laser here? There we go. Uh, there's always a local cell behavior. And it's always got a geometry. In this conference. And timing. The timing is critical. Um, it's something that has to be done right, and uh, both the start of an event and the progression of it. Where does it start from? Where does it spread to? Uh, mechanical properties. What kind of force does it generate? Is it isotropic or anisotropic? Um, mechanical interactions, mechanical context. This turns out to be key in this process. You have these local behaviors, and almost invariably what you're hooked to is critical. And one of the things that we suffer from in our thinking is that we don't know how to deal with information of many types. Because the information to do this is not just of one type. It's, it's counterintuitive interactions at many levels, sometimes within levels, sometimes between levels. Um, and then this is the big hairy one down here, <laughs> the emergent property. So if you look at any of these, and it turns out that um, the big problem is there are at least 11 of these, and all of them are complicated. This is just an example of one of them. What's going on here? Um, um, this is imagination. See, as we start over here, there's a, a pattern to the uh, um, there's a pattern to the apical constriction that occurs in the, the blast before I'll show it to you. This pattern. right there, um, it's got a, a pattern around the blast before that plays into things. It's progressive from edge, presumptive anterior, posterior. 
it generates isotropic, the cell behavior itself, the apicoconstriction of those black cells there is isotropic, but it generates a, a vegetally directed uh, movement. Um, it, the result of it is much more great, much greater than the southern parts. Um, that tour of your machine here. That's uh, Okay. So the one I'm going to talk about is convergent extension first, and then we'll mix in some others. Now this machine um, moves a great deal of tissue. It's the single main engine of gastrulation and nerdy, nerdy body formation. What happens is this marginal zone here in red rolls inside or inwards the notochord up here, the presumptive somatic mesonerve here, and as it involutes, it, it undergoes what we call convergence and extension. And this is a narrowing lengthening of the tissues. In this, in this case, it's by internally generated forces. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, sometimes just passive. And what that does is elongate the body axis on the inside, which you couldn't see. Now on the outside, this blue material, which lies right there, it's going to elongate about 12 fold. And it also is force producing, and it goes in parallel, but faster, actually, than the underlying mesoderm. And the two of them elongate the body axis. Later on, this ventral endoderm here uh, also elongates. That's what builds the spinal cord, uh, the vertebral column, pushes the head away from the butt. So we all be buttheads if we hadn't done this when we gastrulate. Um, now, if you cut that region out up here, of the dorsal lip, and isolate it, as we did many years ago, uh, make a sandwich out of it. We made a sandwich out of it to avoid surface tension issues. And I'll get back to that later. It's covered with an epithelium on all sides. And that reduces the tissue surface tension, and it does two convergence and extensions. One is neural, the blue here, and one is mesendodermal. Here's such an explant. And here's anterior. If you use markers, this list is up here, or TX is up here. This is B9 here, down toward the uh, posterior in the neural. How long is that process? How long is that process? This, this process here takes the same length as gastrulation. If we had the whole thing, this is a part of it, but it's the, the, the dorsal, dorsal part. So it's about four hours. This one would be about four hours. So the explant behaves exactly the same way as it would? Uh, not exactly, but it's very close. It's very close. Um, the larger explant is much more represented. What you see here is just a little narrow stripe. That's the original, and then uh, I'll show you the giant, the one that includes the entire marginals on it. Um, now, back in the day, I got into, I'm not a biomechanician. I uh, aid and abet biomechanical things. But my mentor in this was uh, Amy Cole, Steve Moore, an engineer back at uh, Berkeley. Um, Mimi said, well, if this thing is going to do that, it's got to turn stiff and it's got to push. And so we made this machine. Uh, Steve Moore made this machine. It's called a Histo Wheeler, weighed 2,200 pounds with all of its damping and, uh, uh, tires and uh, bricks and plywood. And uh, we put this little block of tissue in this thing. And we could measure the force with which it could push. And we could also do a, um, a uh, compression stress relaxation test and what we found was that this thing stiffens when it undergoes this <laughs> uh, uh, convergence and extension it gets fourfold stiffer in the AP axis but it doesn't change in the medial-lateral axis and this is it's gushy in both directions medial-laterally and anterior posteriorly before it undergoes this um, uh, transition into convergence and extension and we measured pushing force of about a half a micronewton for two of these things. But since then, Lance Davidson has made measurements that are, are, may have a much more realistic apposition of the measuring device to the tissue, and it can push with much greater strength than that. And so some 40 pascals or something like that. And it's much, it, it eventually, as it starts laying down matrix, really more side skeleton, much different. Now, back in that day, the dominant paradigm was <clears throat> that tissues behave as liquids and interact with one another in ways that are regulated by differential adhesion. 
the Steinberg differential adhesion hypothesis, which was a uh, uh, version of the whole hope freighter different uh, selective infinity hypothesis. Um, so this set the cat among the pigeons in some people's minds, and some people started calling it their, their dynamic solids. Um, this thing, we do, uh, uh, we did a, the original uh, stiffness measurement with what we call the E180, because after three minutes, this thing started pushing back. And so this, this trace will start going back up. Um, it's, it's, uh, and it, it gets stronger through um, the, the progress of convergence and extension and cell interpolation, as you see. Now, the basis of this is actually this. This was uncovered by Paul Wilson and John Schur using the first generation of fluorescent labels back in the 80s. And there's two types of radial interp interpolations here. One is through the plane of the tissue. In other words, if you go in from the outside of the embryo, uh, the, the, the line tangent to the, or uh, perpendicular to the uh, tangent plane to the, uh, to the surface, uh, that's the radial axis. And what you'll find is if you label cells, that they'll, 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 they'll interpolate with the two one another between one another on that axis. In this case, they tend to get between one another along the AP axis, and they produce a thinning and an extension. In other cases, like in the animal cat, they don't have that AP class. And in uh, my old model, there's an epithelium on top of here, and it turns out that part of my old model that they uh, that when they contact the inner surface of the epithelium that you can't see here, uh, these gray cells that pop up there like that surface and they can't get back off of it. There's some you know, contact reaction there and adhesion. So it's a boundary capture mechanism. But Roberto Mayo, we're looking at the animal cap, has actually shown that there's a chemotactic mechanism uh, between the epithelial layer and the animal cap and the deep layer. Um, and Doug D. Simone has found that uh, on the inner surface here, on this back side, the deeper side of this tissue, there's a fibronectin layer that's necessary for another phase of this radial interpolation. So this radial interpolation has at least three mechanisms that, has to, that have to work at different phases of the process. The other process is the lateral interpolation, and you probably, if you're on this planet, you probably have heard of this, um, and that is within the plane of the tissue, and it could be in any dimension, but in this case, we define it as this as medial lateral, which is, by convention, we define that as the convergence axis and the opposite of the uh, uh, transverse axis as being the axis of extension. Now, in the cases that we see this, basically this is the way it works. It's like the red dome. Um, these radial forces tend to squish the dome down, and it's like push your cookie dough or your bread dough down, and the medial lateral forces generated internally tend to pull it the other way. And the result is extension. So there are various proportions of this in the frog. You get a lot of extension and actually some thinning. So both these processes, radial and medial lateral, are quite strong. And so you get a lot of extension, particularly in the notochord. If you go to the Semitic tissue, that, ratio, that, uh, the, that relationship is somewhat different. You, you would get um, thinning, but not quite as much as you would in the notochord. And so pretty much every tissue that does this has its own little scheme. And so that's something that is genetically regulated. Um, the lateral convergence force is directed at tension, extension by a radial depression force. If you go to the mouse, as Wei Wei Yan and Ann Sutherland did, um, um, Normally what happens here in the mouse is you have a, a radial force and it don't appear to have one in the other dimension because the somitic tissue thickens it quite a bit and there's much less extension in the somitic mesoderm. This is in the somitic mesoderm in the mouse. The mouse also grows. The, the frog doesn't. It does not change volume, which is one way that was what one uh, uh, stress reliever in, in terms of <laughs> talking about uh, what happens in a frog, because they, it's been shown long ago that they don't change in volume, with a few exceptions that I won't go into. Um, but this little beast grows. But I originally, when I saw this, I was collaborating with them on this, and I was quite upset that this Semitic tissue thickened, and so I thought probably the radial forces weren't there. 
just goes to show just because something is moving um, um, in this fashion doesn't mean that the process is not there because when uh, Weiwei and Ann knocked out the PC, they, they looked at a PCP mutant, the PPK7 mutant, which, it, it, which this uh, uh, convergence force here has knocked out. That uh, mutant knocked out this convergence that the lateral cell circulation in which you get is a smackdown of the tissue and really, really wide and short somites, which results in the two effects. So just because you see something moving in, an op in a direction um, um, doesn't mean that it's not being resisted. Our sort of concept here is that the embryo is basically you have competing forces um, in many cases, and the result is what you see. Now, <clears throat> what goes on in here? So we know that from this dye tracing cells from the dyes that these circulations occur, but how do they really occur? That, that, what really happens to make them uh, occur? And John Schur, who's probably the best microsurgeon that's ever walked this earth, um, uh, did some fantastic experiments back in, in 92, along with Paul Wilson, um, uh, who also did some did, did extraordinary experiment, experiments. In fact, uh, uh, that's one of the problems today is that we uh, uh, nobody's been able to match some of that work that was done. If you cut out this dorsal region, uh, but this time cut out the, the dorsal marginal zone here, um, but in fact, John actually cut out the entire region here and put it into culture and looked at very large populations of deep cells. Uh, let, let me give you a little bit of anatomy here. What you're looking at here, at here is the outside. It's an epithelium. And in, in doing this convergence and extension, that epithelium may have a role. In the mesoderm, we can't prove that it does. Um, it's a tight junction epithelium. These are deep cells, which are about three layers thick beneath that epithelium. And in the experiments we've done, that is the big muscle uh, to the convergence and extension. Like I said, you can't get an epithelium to behave by itself. It needs contact with something. So we've never been able to, to um, uh, get proof that <coughs> the epithelium contributes something. That may change with the neural plate, that thing that you see extending here on the outside, with some work that's coming from Lance Davidson. Uh, but most, uh, many of the models of cell interpolation involve the, an epithelium with junctional rearrangement. This is different. These are mesenchymal cells. And what they do in these experiments is they become polarized right and left, and that's a PCP-dependent process. It's also dependent on fibronectin layers on this surface here. And if you don't have that fibronectin signaling, uh, this will happen. And what they do is they polarize, they, they become fusiform, they extend protrusions, uh, they attach to their neighbors the gray arrows, they extend protrusions, and then they shorten the, the black arrows, and essentially appear to exert traction on one another and pull themselves between one another, wedging between one another. And um, there's no such thing as a new idea. Um, Conklin, back in looking at the node port of Ascidians uh, saw that in the 20 cells and 20 cells that it, the, the turf lake can make one row of 40 cells in the Ascidian. He says it looks almost as if they shoved their way between one another. He was the first person that actually had some sort of mechanical idea of shoving or wedging themselves between one another. Um, it's an old idea. And so our model is basically <coughs> this. Uh, that these things are exerting traction on one another and pulling themselves between one another. And this is a technique I was recently, students came up to me and said, what kind of kung fu was that? It is not kung fu. <laughs> it's low and heavy illumination, which was shading correction, John was a master of. And what you see, this is the most realistic thing you're ever going to see. How, how, how many hours is this? This, this thing here is, is repeating. We actually have lost. This was originally on optical disc, and we've actually lost a lot of the data. This is the, 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 the metadata about metadata. 
which we did. So it was written down with loss of a flood. But these were these movies were shot at one to three minute. This type of movie was shot at one to three minute intervals. And I'm not sure what it's being played back here, but this will go on continuously for about, uh, in some place, about uh, uh, six hours from mid, from mid gas relation all the way up through halfway through the relation. Um, the, uh, and what you see here are shadows between the cells. And you can see how mesenchymal they are. They're not, they don't have a junctional uh, uh, a, a tight pavement. They don't make a tight pavement. And what they do is they're constantly oscillating in and out and probing and pushing between one another. Actually, what they're doing is they're extending protrusions that they grab and they tug and they pull. Um, and if you look at them in higher mag, you can see all sorts of interesting things that I won't go into. But we can't find any evidence in here for, for rosettes, the, the model of junctional rearrangement that you find in the big machines. Yeah? Is there a stiffness gradient along the convergence axis? Like, is there a stiffness gradient along the convergence axis, starting from the medial line to, to stiffness the gradient. lateral? A stiffness gradient along the convergence axis. You know, uh, uh, that's a good question. We know that when they start doing this, they're fourfold stiffer, but a, a gradient along the axis, there probably is one because Lance Davidson has shown that these things go from the, the during gastrulation they stiffen to about three to four pascals from one to one, one, and a, one, one and a half. They're basically like water, um, but they they'll get up to uh, thirty or forty when they get out into the tailbone stage, and it, the whole thing is progressive. So the stiffness may actually be progressive, and there may be a, a great, but that's why I'm here. You maybe you can find out. <laughs> um, this is what, what it looks like in the first generation of progressive uh, cytoplasmic uh, dyes um, back in the day before molecular probes. That's uh, Open Brown and Bob Gimlick made the first ones in Berkeley. And this is Lance Davidson's version with modern uh, focal microscopy. This is just a little like uh, wide field. And this is the uh, focal. You can see these protrusions. Uh, they're polarized in this dimension. And here uh, is a membrane label, and it's colored green down five micrometers deep. You can see the protrusions knifing between all the other unlabeled cells in here. And on the surface here, they're interacting with fibronectin, with this red stuff, and that protrusive activity is also biased. And this is about a five to seven second interval. These guys are smoking along in, in their, their, their rate of protrusive activity. Whereas this, is, as I said, is probably about a minute. Um, now, many people show you cell intercalation in one place, and they show you other things in another place. This um, <coughs> this is actually this movie, and this is the intercalation pattern. And um, one thing about it is you'll notice that the surface area here decreases. Some cells, have, we've lost a lot of cells, but it, th it tends to thicken up. The way we make this explant is going to become important later. The epithelium is on top away from the microscope, the deep cells are down and they're against a uh, Bielman uh, BSA coated uh, cover slit to lubricate them. They will deposit fiber, they make a fiber negative layer there. If they deposit it on the dish, they will lock up uh, because it's a bipolar cell now glued to the dish and that will kill the circulation. Um, but that surface tension of that bare uh, heat cell layer um, they want to round up on one another, and so we compress it. And that's how we get the, the, the movies. That will become important in a minute. This is a mouse embryo, Margot Williams and Ann Sutherland. They were looking at the same thing in mice. And so this is live imaging of the neural plate. And the basal, this is an epithelium, and the basal ends of these epithelial sheets are also polarized just like this. So most of these epithelial sheets that have been analyzed by junctional rearrangement on the opposite face that you 
see if you drop down a few sections here. Um, um, also had basal protrusive activity. This is the first in the so-called modern era of basal protrusive activity in uh, 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 an epithelial layer. Uh, there was an earlier one back in the early 2000s by Williams Mason and Jeff Harden in the dorsal cells of nematodes. And just recently, they found out that, that Drosophila also, there's a paper that shows that Drosophila also has basal protrusion activity. Um, okay, this is what they look like in scanning EM. Um, they've got these little contact points. This, this, they, these aren't really filopodia, they're uh, due to shrinkage, but they basically have big lamellar protrusions on the ends and kiss points on the side. The cytoskeleton is what we call the node and cable. This is actin label. And what happens is because they contact each other on the side, one cell will use the side of another cell for traction. And so every place that you see cadherins, the cadherins collect around the lamellopodia that, that, that stick down. They're in green here. What happens is when you get an adhesion, then you get a cytoskeleton tessellated back into the cell, and it will either go to one of these nodes or and then on to another adhesion or between two adhesions. And so they build these skeletons across vast distances of contacts and cables, and they're all interlacing. But these things stretch way the hell across uh, the uh, explant, uh, uh, across at some point 33 uh, millimeters into these giant units. And then sometimes you'll see whole collections or rows of, of of cells shearing with respect to others if it, it, as if they'd gotten together and formed a collusion here to interact among themselves and then there'll be another one here and they'll they'll shimmy and shear with respect to one another. Some sort of uh, organization. I, I'm kind of blitzed. I'm touching the wrong things here, I think. Okay, now we wanted to demonstrate. So, so what happened at the yellow dots in, in the previous figure? W what's the yellow dot? Oh, that the um, that's cadherin. That's uh, these. Uh, one more. Yeah. Oh, um, these these are the these are um, uh, uh, the dots where it, it appears that the, it's a connection that we don't really understand. That there's no adhesion there that we can find, and th these nodes tend to swim around uh, right beneath the plasma membrane. Um, um, but they're they're not associated with cadherins, so we don't we don't know we, it's not clear. There's actually another side of skeleton that's between this side of skeleton and the plasma membrane. It's like a rag doll, and that thing seems to the deeper node and cable. It's within a micron of the surface, very close to the surface. But there's yet another side of skeleton there that you can't see in the front but We have to use turf microscopy. Uh, really high uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. And that one seems to coalesce into a flood. It's a complicated story. We went up with, used uh, Eric Betzik's, uh, Catherine Pfister, whose picture you'll see later. She went up and worked with Eric Betzik to try to image both at the same time with the vessel beam. And it, it looks like there's some sort of complex interaction between that side of the skeleton and forming these nodes. Uh, in other words, the two are interacting. But we, the nodes, the nodes may not be the same, but we're, as these can here, and I colored in these places where there's a, 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 a this is a black and white uh, affair here, and uh, I just made a static image out of it, and I colored it in every place the adhesions were, and then the places where you can't find, couldn't find them. Just, just one second, so they are inside the cells, or at the drug rate? There, there, oh, that's a cytoskeleton. It's an actin cytoskeleton. It's inside the membrane. But there's actually two cytoskeletons there. One we didn't know about. 
Uh, okay, so um, so Ken, is the idea is that this has something to do with the shrinkage of this circumplast oral region, and so we made a giant explant by cutting here, unwrapping this thing, the entire marginal zone into the same thing we have here: dorsal, presumptive notochord somites. Um, the leading edge mesoderm here. And that sandwich normally, the main sandwich out of it normally, you'll do this, it converges and extends. Now you see the full blown uh, thing. You have a Maha uh, asked earlier uh, how normal this is. This is the big boy of the entire circumplastic portal region. You can see that it does much more extension. And it's a simple matter that to make that explant, the cells are going to interpolate this way. And we insert between the two layers of fibronectin for a piece of plastic, which is glued down, and one of them was free here, and it, we found out it would tow quite a good sizable piece of tissue, and so then we put a fiber optic measuring device on it. It's calibrated and measured the tension which it, 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 that it could develop, and this is a pretty crude machine. Lance took the, the, the better machine with him to Pittsburgh, but we got something out of this one. Um, so this is what happens. Gastrulation ends at about, after about right there. And so through gastrulation, the force trace rises. Then there's a plateau, and then it will continue to go up, on, up through early tailbud. And all these tissues that do convergence and extension uh, upregulate the neural, the notochord, the somite, all upregulate myosin 2B. Myosin 2B is a slow myosin. It's got about half the ATPase activity and uh, active uh, transport rate as myosin 2A. If we knock down half of myosin 2A, we get we can't dent, dent the, the force trace. So there's plenty, must be plenty. And this morpholino was problematic. We can never get rid of more than half of it. So we don't know. If we know that myosin 2A is probably quite important, we just can't get rid of it. Mass of 2B, we can take down, and a moderate takedown just drops the force trace but leaves it pretty much in the same shape with this plateau here. And uh, we think that that myosin, because of its characteristics, is probably a crosslinker. Um, now, if you look at the, what happens in the embryo, I'm going to tell you the pattern of this medial interpolation behavior in a minute, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that. Uh, we're interested in the, the forces that could be developed around uh, the circum circumference of the marginal zone here, and we made that giant explant. Now, what happens in the embryo that corresponds to this decrease in force? Well, here's the uninjected, and here's my acid 2B morpholino. And what you can see is these guys try to uh, squeeze down at low, uh, lower doses. And some of them are pretty successful, but most of them are not all that successful. And they'll, they'll, they'll push along, you think they're getting somewhere, and then uh, they'll reverse. Um, this is being repeated, so that's what that's, uh, we have to keep that in mind. Um, and the heavier the dose, the less, uh, well, they will squeeze that last force shut. And if you look at the cytoskeleton that these, uh, at these, uh, these animals. This is a standard nodal cable. It's actually pretty conservative in the movement of these nodes. Um, but when you knock down 2A, they become really stretchy wretchy. And uh, it's basically like we've turned all these cables into rubber bands. And so the force that they can transmit, our, our interpretation of this is that the force that they can transmit across the cell and then across a long chain of cells is. is dropped, uh, as you see here. Um, and one of the caveats to messing around with myosins is, that, especially myosin 2B, it's actually important in assembling cat hair adhesions. So at a high dose, they, they would just fall apart, and they gush around in whatever space is open by active liberalization, probably mostly. Now, putting players on the field. It turns out that this thing is like a shotgun, and it, it can go off in any direction, this convergence and extension. 
It can push through an embryo. It can tear an embryo to pieces. It has shoved other embryos around. It's a, a, a very powerful machine. Um, and if it's misregulated, all hell breaks loose. And that's what generally happens in multiple molecular perturbations that people do. And they all probably have, like most of them have very complicated reasons. So how do we put the, how, do, how does MIB occur in the embryo around that plastic board? Well, this is it. And it's complicated, but it's elegantly simple. You see these green arcs here? Those uh, are arcs that I'm going to want you to pretend are windows. And this MIB, this myelin intercalation behavior, will spread from an anterior part here, um, and it will all of a sudden appear in this first arc here. And then it will be unseen until it pops into this arc. <coughs> there's a continuum. What I'm saying is there's a con this is a continuum. It doesn't occur in arcs. What I want you to do is get an idea of the geometry by using the arcs. Now, these arcs are all anchored in this vaginal endoderm here, which is a big, stiff mass it's the big blob that everything else moves around. And it actually does move too, as I'll tell you later. So um, what happens is MIB spreads in a boot like fashion here. It starts here, goes posteriorly. The light end is posterior in the direction, in the AP direction here, see? This is anterior, this is presumptive posterior. Anterior, presumptive posterior to submit. Tissues. Now, the medial lateral axes, these are actually the medial lateral axes. They'll all be straight across like this at the end of all of this. And the uh, dark ones are anterior, just like the corresponding to the dark vein the ends of the arrows. Uh, and MIB is going to spread in these hoop, this hoop like pattern. And so, everywhere you see one of these green things, you're going to see these, uh, this MIB pop up. Okay? you cut this thing out and make a giant explant out of it, this is how we know this. John Shearer made these big explants, and then he put various amounts of compression on them. And some of them will go ahead and distort, and others won't. It depends on how much resistance you put on them. And if you put resistance on them, the cells will become very elongated, um, as if they are trying to walk out on each other and stretch each other. Um, so now we're going to look at different places in this pattern here in cell behaviors. And the first place we're going to look is the dawn of the whole MIB progression right up here in the anterior. And if I, you enlarge this, I'll tell you what the pattern is. We're going to look at this spot. But what happens is it originates here and here, bilaterally, not in the midline. And it works its way toward the midline here. And the node board is not formed yet. There's no boundary. This is what we call the vaginal alignment zone. And from this origin, it's going to go down along the lateral uh, margins of the Semitic tissue. Believe me, this is the lateral margin of this. I'll show you later. That fact is true. And then when it does begin here in the nose cord, it's going to go back along the nose cord. So my boundary from anterior to posterior. So yellow is anterior to posterior, and green is lateral to medial. Okay? And we're just looking at this, I look at right in here, you're going to see some elongation and alignment. And you see the cells swimming between one another. And you see these cells up here. That's, that's a contaminating migratory mesoderm cells. These are cells that have not gotten the message yet. They're, they are uh, up here somewhere. Um, so that's the vaginal alignment zone. And we mapped this out and quantitated the uh, cell shapes back in the day. Now we're going to look at node cord somatic boundary formation. The boundary actually forms through intercalating cells. There's no sense in trying to prejudge the logic of these systems. So what we've got here now, the boundary is going to form here, and you'll see this behavior go back this way, and you'll see it go back on the inside of this boundary here. You won't see anything over here, but the same thing is happening over here, anterior, posterior, lateral, to medial. And that lateral to medial occurs both in the Semitic tissue and in the nodal tissue. And right through here, you can see there's a lot of intercalation going on here, the elongation and alignment, not down here, not up there. Now, you see the boundary drop out, and there's a tongue of nodal cord pulled out of the Semitic mesoderm. Now, watch <laughs> vacuolation. 
Inoculation is going to start there, 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 there. And it's going to sweep across. You can see these little vacuoles forming here. It's intense there, and it goes back along the boundary like that. The vacuolation is actually easier to see than the cell shapes. Now, this thing is compressed to where it didn't move much at all, and you get a distortion of the pattern because of that. And you'll notice that these cells back up here never get the way. <coughs> it's, it's highly probable that this boundary potentiates the spread of the signal toward the central core here. This is, this is something that, we, that many, many movies and other experiments <coughs> show. This one is a prisoner now, and it has not been allowed to move very much. This is this section here, and it's under a looser cover slip to where it can move and interpolate. And I'm, I'm looping this forward and then directly backwards instead of a loop back to the beginning. Um, so you can see how this thing, that the interpolation is insidiously powerful because just a little bit of most of it's over here. But the, what's happening between here and the other, about there, um, a, a little bit of interpolation between these cells will pull these, the semitic tissue, of which there's not much, um, in like this. Now, the neural cord somite boundary here, you see that blending? That's an F and F mediated uh, behavior there that assures that it stays a, a, a boundary. They keep kissing each other and keeping in touch, but that boundary also doesn't want to come apart. But yet it slips this way. It slides this way. And here's boundary here. It's, it's right there. And uh, these cells will elongate and align progressively back up this way along the boundary. But back in the central region here, they never adopt this elongated shape. Again, because we didn't allow them. Here's basically when we put one of these under under glass and let it develop without distorting, without being able to move, and you get these this huge sweep of interpolating elongated line cells. Mm -hmm. It won't go back all that far. Uh, 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 we get these clefts here that are probably submitting sorts of thing, discontinuities that behave funny. And the back end here never reaches that. We're back here in the submitting tissue or in the submitting tissue here. Sorry, where, yeah. where would be the first somite here? Pardon? Where would be the first somite? That's a good question. There's a groove right in here. That's probably it. Um, there's a, a groove there, a groove there. We don't know. We don't know the groove. Great. Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, well, this pattern is... is uh, um, this pattern is not um, predetermined. If you scatter cells here that, that into this array, that uh, don't uh, uh, from the epidermis or from node ports at, at regions uh, early in gastrulation, they adopt the same pattern. Uh, you can uh, it basically no no regulates this on a close order. They, they were, we did we. Uh, inhibited no over a 15 minute uh, uh, scale, uh, time scale, and it, uh, it basically regulates the whole progress. This is, um, um, uh, we can dorsal, it, it anterior dorsal ride, dorsalize these things, make the uh, conversion suspension occur all around the perimeter at the same time, and basically that progressive timing and the uh, hoop like array here has to occur, or else you get exogastrulated or, or a snout sticking straight out. Um, I won't talk about this. This is another movement that also generates force that actually feeds things from the outside into um, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, involution point where CE takes over and basically it's an adhesion regulated thing. Um, the, uh, they lose, they, the deep cells lose adhesion, they ball up, and then when you, during this convergent thickening, the surface tension rises, uh, uh, they're in a circular array, and so they squeeze that region of the embryo, and then the epithelium respreads on the underlying tissue, 
And here you can see this is the deep tissue here. This is the adhesion. They back across the line and uh, where else brought that up. And basically what happens is you get a loss of uh, an increase in tissue surface tension and that ring tries to get smaller and thicker and diameter and thicker. We can, uh, there are a bunch of nuances about the force generation that all makes sense in the context of these two machines. And basically, one of the problems with it is that you've got progressive um, MIB passing around the, uh, the marginal zone here, and it's quite stiff. You've got CT, the conversion thickening down here. These cells, these cells have, uh, are progressively adopting that behavior. Um, and if you challenge, if you normally these, the conversion uh, extension MIT process never pulls on anything but the lateral edge of the stiff end of the nerve. It never acts in series. But one of the defects in gas relation is when that does happen, we simulate that by taking coring the uh, embryo, get rid of the end of the nerve here, and cutting around the outside to get the marginal zone, and then ask it to climb the tower. And if this if this uh, has gone a good ways to where this is stiff enough, it can climb a tower pretty well. If it can't, basically what happens is this part stretches this to where it's just a little bit. Um, these, oh, the zipper. Um, you wonder, you might wonder why these are truncated here on the outside, on both sides. Uh, they just go up and in. What happens is um, the node port shears backward relative. These are corresponding parts at the end of gas relation for the, uh, for the neural uh, uh, the tail bud. What happens is the node port goes faster and it shears back along this line. And right there is a uh, posterior uh, point of deposition of fibrillin, which is a magic molecule that glues this together and also has signaling roles, probably uh, BNP inhibition, and so it acts as a zipper to oppose this. So that's another nuance. Um, this is stuff about one thing that, uh, that uh, we recently just helped out with, with uh, Chris Kittner's lab. All these convergent extension processes generate a lot of strain, and that's the strain pattern that came out of my old Bible back maps many years ago, and the uh, Kintner lab has been able to show um, that that strain can not only regulate the polarity of the cilia, the, the, the low moving cilia and gaseous seal roof plate, but also the length and the vigor of the beating depending upon the strain. The sad cases of the past pioneers, all of these guys died this last year. Uh, Genesis. This is my crew here. Most of them are gone now. And uh, Tim, uh, I'm working with them in practice now. It's Tim Mullen. Blue back here somewhere behind the post. He's got this uh, wave out there. Tim uh, is here. Thank you. before we break for the break, uh, over which we can have more questions, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So you talked about uh, nodal being important for the continuing of convergence extension. You talked about nodal being important for convergence extension continuing. Do you know which in which cells the nodal signaling is happening and what behaviors that drive specifically? That's a good question. There's this paper by Lux Ardia at Kujin Bachian's lab that addresses that and their contention. They're, they think that there's an early vegetal uh, derived signal by, I uh, see the nodals one and two or five and six, I always get them mixed up, that specify induced mesoderm. And then there's a second um, nodal activity that actually patterns morphogenesis, and that's the other two nodals. But all the classic experiments don't really distinguish between this, that signal that goes, it, 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 it uh, regulates it, 
it basically regulates AP progression is what our experiments show. And that's around the blastopore. Most people don't even know, know that that is the, the AP axis, which is, 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 is strange. <laughs> we, there's, there's, uh, when we make an explant, that uh, progression is not a lot vigorous. It goes a certain distance and then it peters out. In it, in, so there may, that progression may actually be in the end of it. And we, we don't, we're not convinced that there is this clear distinction between patterning tissue differentiation and the progression of MIB. But what you can do is you can put these embryos in, in, in uh, the note, note with SB 5051-24 for 15 minute intervals. And what you get is an amazing freezing of all the blastopore, circumblastopore movements and bottle cell uh, uh, formation some offset distance out later. And everything anterior to that, uh, or a lot of things seem to be normal, others not. But they'll go ahead and make neural folds and everything, but with uh, MIB and convergence things with extension growth. But there's, uh, there's actually some, um, uh, Marty Brevenlou and Eric Sidja did some a paper just recently on timing, went regulation of nodal signals in these human embryoids. Um, we don't know what's going on there, but, but there's a long history of nodal. Uh, if you dump nodal on animal cap, it causes it to, to extend. But what, we, what the, our experiments show is that it's regulating it on a 15 minute timeline, but then it's offset. In other words, you, you do it back in the blastula stage, and then the result is in the gastro and the all the way out of the stage. And it looks like it's just a, 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 an upstream, that MIB is just upstream of all the other cascades of AP pattern. Let's thank both speakers from this morning again. <laughs> Those of you who have posters and want to put them up, uh, Aditi can walk you to where you can put them up. Uh, there are refreshments outside. The restroom is just around the corner. We'll reconvene in 15 minutes at 11.15.